So welcome again. I would like to welcome, first of all, our practitioners, who are Catherine Rubel from the Secretariat of the European Parliament and Antoine Buchet from the European Commission. And the idea of this entire event here is to get uh, feedback from practitioners to our book, which is forthcoming with Oxford University Press, on the role of the parliament in comatology. So what we did, and we four authors, will just make a very short introductory statement for about three minutes, of about three minutes each, in order to give those who have not read the manuscript, which, like the practitioners, which is about 200 pages long, uh, to give you just a little bit of background. So the idea in this book was an idea which actually came up five years ago, I'm ashamed to say, and took so long to be borne out and elaborated theoretically and empirically. The idea of the role of the parliament under delegated uh, legislation with the kind of starting uh, hypothesis that with the increasing empowerment of the parliament, the commission and the council would use more delegation to circumvent the parliament. That was in a way the basic idea which was of interest to us and which we looked at from different angles. What we did in the chapters is we have a kind of theoretical framework which we developed based on rational choice institutionalism um, power-based bargaining theory and a functionalist explanation of why delegation saves transaction costs in order to explain why more delegation is being used. And we use then in a longitudinal qualitative chapter we show over the entire duration of delegated legislation what the role of the parliament was and how the parliament was able to strengthen its role under comitology, basically the hypothesis being the parl parliament used a cross arena linkage uh, in order to strengthen its role under comitology. In other words, it, made, uh, it took substantive decision-making processes as a hostage in order to ask for and claim rights, institutional rights, widening its competencies under delegated legislation. And we study this and look at this in a qualitative longitudinal chapter from the beginnings of comitology until today. Then we have a quantitative, large quantitative part of uh, the book in which we do have an entire quantitative analysis of legislation and delegation as it developed over time, about uh, across the decades. Um, and then we have a focus, we narrow the focus on showing indeed how our hypothesis as regarding the empowerment of the parliament and the reaction of the commission and the council to the empowerment of the parliament plays out in environmental policy and in uh, tax policy and agri uh, agricultural policy. And then we conclude our book. So that's, in a nutshell, our argument. And I would like now to invite my co-authors, Katrin, Karina, and Frederick, uh, to comment our work. So every time that I teach my students about comitology, I, they look at me with boredom on their face and there is really no way uh, I can interest them and I'm trying because comitology is fascinating. Uh, it looks very technical, but it is um, especially fascinating uh, when in these comitology committees you do legislation. So when you use comitology committees to do something that could be done by parliament. And, uh, and yet there is many reasons to do that because it's quicker, it's more efficient. Um, but of course the European Parliament is not happy about that. Uh, and he, it's really fascinating to look at this political fight that the European, Parla European Parliament have, has been, uh, um, has committed to do and how he won, how it won this political fight as he, as he always do, or as he almost always do in the long term. Um, it's uh, also very interesting to observe that when the rules 
change. Uh, actors of Commission, Council and Parliament adjust their behaviour instantly. Um, for example, when, when you have, you stop to use consultation and you pass to co-decision, or when you change the rules of comitology themselves, the actors who will try the day after that to use uh, the new rules, the rules in which they have more power, and that's really fascinating to observe. Especially interesting was to see that um, in the period after the signing of a treaty which introduced co-decision, and before it's entered into force, you, had, you, you could observe and witness the Council and the Commission wishing to delegate before the involvement of the European Parliament. And uh, I conclude with another very interesting finding, which is that uh, you observe that so when the rules change, the actors the day after try to, to use more often the rule, the, 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 procedure, the, uh, the procedure in which they have been empowered. And, but that is enthusiasm for the new rule declines over time. Like if you had a very strong political battle taking place just after a change of the rules, and then the interest for this political battle declines a, bit, a little bit over time. Yeah. Yeah, um, oh, sorry. Okay. Mm. Um, it's not a large room. It's usually I speak without a microphone in the size of a room, but um, <laughs> thank you. Um, I will just comment a little bit about the, the, the quantitative analysis that we did of uh, European legislation which was, in a sense, ambitious because we wanted to trace patterns in uh, legislation going back from 1970 up to uh, 2008. And, um, and one of the, the purposes of this research was to show, well, we talk about European law, everybody talks about the importance of European law, but how much, how big a proportion of European law is actually made up of acts uh, um, adopted under delegation. And uh, of course, quantitative analysis, as we also discuss in the chapter, will only give us so much because we, we cannot see the substantial character of the acts that we, the, we compare. But looking at sort of just the, the, the numerical um, uh, patterns of things, we see that around 75% of all legislation in the European Union is actually delegated acts. Uh, and that the difference in proportion is different whether we look at directives and uh, whether we look at regulations, whereas directives, it, uh, it is a lower proportion uh, of directives that are delegated, uh, only 40% compared to regulations where it constitutes 80% of all regulations are delegated acts. Um, I don't want to bore you with all the specific details of it, but one uh, interesting finding in this quantitative study was that you actually see a correlation of uh, the, the amount of delegation or the share of delegation in an area or the dominance of delegation in an area and the use of legal instrument regulation versus directive. And we discuss uh, in our work that this pattern is somehow due to that there's the common motives in, in, uh, in the supranational uh, character of regulations in imposing a uniform legal regime and also in the sort of act of delegating uh, legislation in the European Union. Um, overall, when we look at the trends in legislation, we find that over time there's been a, a trend towards increased use of uh, regulation. Uh, uh, which can sort of, there's an overall increase, but this increase is, is uh, seen in some particular area when we break down the analysis by, by different policy fields. Uh, and we also see an increase in delegation, um, both in the amount of acts, delegated acts that are ad adopted per year increases over time in the uh, period we look at, but also the proportion that delegated acts constitute of the number of legal acts uh, have increased in the period in, uh, in every uh, policy area. So it's an aggregate trend, but it's also a trend that we find in the, um, in the individual areas. 
I think that's what I'd like to say overall about this. Right. Well, shortly about me and my role in, the, in this project, I, I devoted years from years ago on cometology because that's what I wrote four years about in, my, in what, what was my dissertation uh, to become doctor. And I published a book on that. And then for quite some years, I have to, be, have to admit that I've been very fed up with cometology. <laughs> and it's not necessarily good for your reputation. It's not necessarily good for your reputation, particularly not going back to Sweden, to, you know, only to work, or to work, work too much on cometology. So, so I've avoided it a bit, but, but sort of my, 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 my anchorage to the topic during all the, these years have been this, this group and the link to Florence. And, and now we're sort of uh, harvesting the fruits of that. I, I want to say that because I have all reasons to be humble in this project. I think I've, I've participated more as, as a legal scientist uh, and perhaps best times as a source of inspiration, but, but not, I have not been an author in the, in the quantitative sense as my colleagues have. Having said that, uh, spending a few minutes, few minutes uh, on saying something from, from my personal angle, I, I want to clarify overlapping to some extent what Karina said. Uh, comitology, as we know it from, from long time in the past, after Lisbon is, is what I think I added before Christmas some pages on which, which are interesting to say something about now. I mean, the recent development, which is not primarily the source of study, of, of intense sort of study in the book, because we look to the, at the period up to the Lisbon Treaty. But after the Lisbon Treaty, particularly from a lawyer's point of view, there are two notions, two fundamental notions which are interesting to, to, to know, which is a fundamental distinction between legislation and non-legislation which is less clearly stated in the treaties uh, compared to how they were in the constitutional treaty. But there is a category of non-legislation. And quantitatively, I would say basically, or, or, or mainly, non-legislation is what we used to call comitology and, and rulemaking by the commission, which means uh, regulations, directives, they in a quantitative sense, most of them by far are adopted by the, by the commission, in particular after the Lisbon Treaty. The reason after the Lisbon Treaty is actually that the legislature, the Council and the European Parliament have been adopting relatively little compared to before. So sort of the, the share of commission non-legislation or directives and regulations is, is very high at the moment, much, much above the, 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 you know, that of the, the legislature. That sort of phenomena, which was not called legislation before, but comet, com comitology and, and delegation is now called uh, non-legislation, and in the Lisbon Treaty and trying to be brief on, on that formal part. It's what used to be comitology and delegated rulemaking is cut up into two. The old system is cut up into two new systems, we could say, and they manifested in, in two articles in the Treaty on the European, on the functioning of the European Union, Article 290 and Article 291. One talking about delegation and the other talking about implementation, the, the delegating, talking about control of what the Commission is doing, and then it's control exercised by the legislature, the, the parliament, and the Council, whereas when it comes to the control of implementation, it's still the old comitology system, basically. Now, since a bit more than six months manifested in, in a regulation, a regulation adopted by the Council and the European Parliament. Whereas control or the details of the control under, and the operation in general under delegation is more or less uh, also, since before the summer, manifested in, in a non-legally binding quasi-informal common understanding between the three institutions. Uh, when it comes to the now existing smaller uh, comitology system and, and, the, and, the, and the regulation on that, I would say roughly there is no major change compared to before. There are some changes in, in details and changes in vocabulary, but it's the old comitology system, to my mind. Uh, when it comes to the delegation, the supposedly new added feature, it's difficult. It's unter I, I think it's not so certain as some people would have thought before that it means a major change. And one reason why I would say that is looking, uh, which we have done very briefly, you know, at the empirics, the experience we have since after the coming into force of the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, extremely few delegated acts have been adopted. I think four in 2010 and three, I can't remember exactly the past year, but a very small number. So we could say, you know, whatever in theory the implications, the enormous implications, the revolutionary implications could be of, of that a delegated procedure. Uh, in practice, this far, extremely insignificant. So in practice, basically everything is still about comatology, and I'm saying that basically, as I said before, being the old system. I think maybe even more difficult for the parliament to deal with than before, because 
the comitology system now is more clearly defined as a control exercise by member states, and therefore sort of the, lo the logic for the European Parliament to claim to be involved in the daily exercise of it is, is not there anymore, which, which, which is, was arguable maybe to say that it was before. Uh, final point, I think, looking once again very quickly uh, at the experience with the empirics since the entry into force of the of the Lisbon Treaty, as I said, few acts of adopted of delegated acts, but at the same time, if one go one step further and look into the legislation which has been passed since, since the Lisbon Treaty and looking for delegation clauses, i.e. the Council, European Parliament, enabling the Commission to adopt these delegated acts, I would say there, that I was surprised to find that there were quite some of them. So that would lead me to, to a sort of a very preliminary conclusion that the reason why there are few delegated acts adopted in a quantitative sense is not that the Commission has not been enabled to do it, i.e. that the Council or the European Parliament hasn't been able to agree to give the Commission you know, the preconditions to do it, but that the Commission has not exercised the possibilities which are there, which I think is interesting to assess further. It's an interesting indication to check you know, to what extent it really holds. Uh, well, I can stop there. Yeah, that of course would be a very interesting point for our discussion. I think I would like to invite our practitioners now to react to what they got of their table. And Thanks. Uh, so what I should say first, all comments are personal comments. So even if you have European Parliament, I'm not the European Parliament. <laughs> um, I think the, the, the basic idea of that book is very interesting because it's really from a practitioner's point of view, when you are in the daily battles of things, you don't look at the big patterns as you have done. This is really something uh, we, we, we don't do. Huh? I mean, I've spoken to, to a colleague on the phone yesterday, uh, asked me, what are you doing? Oh, I'm reading a book. Oh, a book, a whole book. <laughs> 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 and I, I gave only this one example, uh, which was one of your basic ideas or findings, to say that with co-decision, there was a trend to delegate more. I mean, this is something we would not see in everyday life because, I mean, you just don't have the time or the energy to look at these patterns of what you have done. So for me, that was really very interesting uh, to read. Um, there is, well, there are two points where I have some slight problems, huh? but I mean, uh, I think we're here to discuss this, so don't take it, uh, don't take it too wrong. I think, um, also what you said, uh, Catherine, uh, it's all about things which Parliament could have done itself. I mean, that seems to be your basic assumption. And to my mind, that neglects a little bit what we are talking about. I mean, when you look at the kind of decisions which are taken in comitology, of course, I mean, there might be people in Parliament who argue we need to do everything, but I think many people would also argue it depends on the kind of decision. Uh, I mean, when you look at it, uh, I went to the Commission's comitology register yesterday just to see what was here this week. It's about fixing prices for eggs or wheat or uh, setting the common format of how you import certain products. I'm not sure I would find too many members who will say on a daily basis I want to fix the price of wheat. Um, so I think one, one also needs to look at the kind of decisions which are being taken. And your, your basic assumption is we would fight for everything. Uh, so your, your, your starting point was to say maximize institutional power to increase uh, influence over policy outcomes. I mean, there is a, one has to ask the question, what is really legislative in nature? And we've had with the Treaty of Lisbon now exactly that discussion because that forced us to think what is legislative in nature? And what is really something you give as a legislator to the executive? Uh, 
So to my mind, it's really also about uh, looking at what kind of decisions are subject to comitology. I mean, that's, when I read it, that was one of the main things which sort of turned in my head. And in a way, you also have it in your book because um, you, uh, you later look whether Parliament would systematically oppose uh, comitology. And your surprising finding was that it did not, in a way. And then you try to to explain, and uh, there's also uh, one of my colleagues, I don't know who it was, quoted, who says, well, we're looking for influence on sensitive things. Maybe that's not, sensitivity is not the only criteria. I mean, it can be the criteria that you look for things uh, which impact on citizen or whatever, but it's, I, I don't have the immediate category of matters for substance where you where we would be looking for. But in a way, you, you find it also in your book. Huh? You, you see that it's not fighting for everything and opposing comitology completely. And to my mind, that really shows that people also, when they make legislation, they, they look at the things which are supposed to be decided by it. And uh, a member say, if I say, now you need to fight that you have an influence on doing this or that, uh, you know, they also look at what it is. Uh, so I think that's one basic comment I wanted to make. It's also about looking what kind of decisions there are. And the second, maybe a bit more technical or minor point, I think when I started reading this, I had a big confusion because you used the term delegation. Uh, <laughs> um, while now from a practical mindset, uh, delegated acts are very much defined. And you use the term delegation and delegated acts for your entire analysis of, uh, of comitology. So maybe a, a practical way out of this would be to say, if you really use the, the legal term of delegated act, you would have to put it in italics, so I don't know. But it was a big confusion for me. So I think there is a need to, uh, to be clear uh, about like the legal term of delegated act and about um, like your whole subject matter in a way. Uh, so these are two comments. Uh, I have a lot of minor points maybe on the chapter three, but that's maybe we can also do uh, bilaterally. I think we should maybe immediately go on to Antoine Boucher before we open the discussion for everybody on everything. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. Um, uh, I maybe a few words about who I am. Uh, I studied law in France, and I was a judge at the very beginning of my career. I joined the Ministry of Justice, and my field of interest were um, international criminal law, international private law, uh, and uh, fundamental rights. Uh, I was the French government agent before the uh, European Court of Human Rights uh, for several years before I joined the Commission. Uh, I joined the Commission first to, to deal with uh, judicial cooperation in uh, civil matters, uh, Brussels 1, Rome 1, Rome 2, all this stuff. And then uh, I followed someone to the SecGen one day. He said, well, come, come to the SecGen. We will have fun. We will do comitology. <laughs> OK. Uh, never heard of comitology before, and, and then I started to try to understand what it is, uh, and then I also started to try to explain to my family what I was doing in the commission, <laughs> and this it became quite complicated to explain to your kids what is comitology, and, and I failed. So I moved to Scientology, <laughs> then they understand, even if I don't look like Tom Cruise, uh, they say, okay, you are a member of a sect, that's right the sect of the new church of comitology. Uh, in 2007, so I joined the sect gen, and then I worked on the reform, I mean, the, the first reform, not, not the first reform, but the reform of the reform of the reform. <laughs> the 2006 reform, introducing the, the PRAC, we use the French acronym because it's stronger than LPS, regulatory procedure scrutiny, so PRAC, Procedure de Réglementation avec Contrôle, and I, I did the alignment, so we screened all, I mean, 200 and 50, I think, 
think, uh, legislative acts, and we we analyze them in order to replace old comitology by PRAC. So it was very interesting for me to have an overview of what are the powers of the Commission and also to realize that very often the Commission does not use its powers and it's something which is probably missing. I would like to know quantitatively uh, how many powers are never used by the Commission because there are many. Uh, I mean, empirically, I have seen, for example, from DG Senko, I was trying to have it, but what are you doing exactly with that part? Well, we don't know one one because we don't use it. Okay, um, so coming back now to, to, the, to the book, um, I must say I, I, I really like it because I understand something I have never understood by comatology, is the world picture, of course, as Catherine has just said. Uh, working on a daily basis on the reform of Prague, then on the Treaty of Lisbon reform, uh, I was not able to see the whole picture and also the whole history of it. And this is for me, of course, uh, very interesting to see what happened before and what are the reasons why the Council, the EP, the Commission behave as they behave. Uh, and and uh, we, we, we do it instinctively, I mean, by instinct. Working for the Commission, yes, we do it like this, but we don't understand exactly why. It's like a, a kind of subconscious, uh, collective subconscious. And, and it's very true, it's very true. Um, maybe I would like to, to make a few remarks on the book, then move to uh, something on the future of comitology, which is uh, tackled in the book, but mostly in the conclusion. Um, first of all, I. I do like and, and share the, the analysis, the, I mean, the, the, the fact that it's the angle of the book, the power distribution angle is, is a good one. Um, personally, I would add also more psychological or a little bit of anthropology in it. Um, why that? Because, you know, it's not only about power grabbing, it's also about why, for example, very often in your book, council commission together against parliament. Which is true, which is true. Politically, it's not. I mean, politically, officially, the Commission would like to be seen as a friend of the Parliament, and 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 because we are more Europe optimists normally, and the Council is seen as the one who, the one, uh, the, the institution which are trying to slow down the process, which is also true. But the people within the Commission are by training, by education, the same as the one in the council. They are bureaucrats, all of them. And it's the classical battle experts versus politicians. We do know what to do when these stupid members of parliament they don't know. So why we should trust parliament? It's the very classical way. And, and that's why, for example, uh, why we want more delegation. Because we want to work with our friends, our peers in the council, member states, because they look like us. So it's, a, it, it's, it's one explanation as well. It's not only about the power, it's about the comfort. It was a personal comfort. Because they don't know in the Commission how to work with Parliament. They are lost. For example, when, when you prepare a in the past, when you, you were preparing a very difficult measure under the PRAC, there was a veto, uh, the risk of veto. So I talked to my people and say, look, you have to work well in advance with the parliament. And their reaction was, but with whom in parliament? With the secretariat, with the, with the, 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 the committee, with the rapporteur, with whom there is no rapporteur yet, we don't know. So they are lost. And even when they know, they are reluctant. I mean, there is a kind of natural reluctance. I don't like it, but that's, that's a fact. It's something it, which should be seen somewhere that there is, a, of course, kind of a, a, a natural uh, a partnership between member states and, and commission. Also because of history, because it was the case before. They, they learned to work together in the past, and parliament was the new player. Um, it will change uh, with it has, it has started to change with Prague. It will change now with Delegated Act because it's a, now a kind of legal 
and political obligation for the Commission to work with the Parliament to prepare delegated acts. And it's a strong instructions for, from the Commission uh, uh, hierarchy now to do it. Uh, so that's one, one thing. Uh, there are also, uh, Catherine said, maybe some adjustments about um, uh, some part. For example, on the Lumphalusi, I really don't follow what you have said. I mean, just that committal, all comitology is still applicable to Lamphalusi. Uh, this part, I just, just don't understand. So probably we have to discuss a little bit because um, it's true that all the financial supervision area is a strange one, and it will remain a strange one. And we have had uh, many regulations in the beginning of 2010, I think, adopted with a lot of delegated act. Hundreds of delegated delegation of powers in accordance with new Article 290, and with very strange way of working, and and quite unorthodox. And I, I must say, uh, uh, of the record, of course, I know I'm record uh, illegal. But that's that's my personal point of view. Um, so yes, financial supervision is still a, a specific area, but to say it's completely outside is a little bit unclear in the, in the text. Um, also about the constitution, the part on the constitution, um, I don't, you, you refer only to article 136. I think it's simple, in simpler than that. You have, you, you had in the constitution, article 136, 137, and they became quite automatically article 290, 291. I mean, there was no discussion on this uh, uh, only Austria and I don't remember another another country. They have said we would like to reopen this, but it was clear for from the German presidency at this time in, in the end of I mean in 2007 we reopen only if there is unanimity to reopen, and there was of course no unanimity to reopen to 90 to 91 uh, 136 137. Then they became they were completely just just adapted to the new Lisbon Treaty context, and they became 290 to 91. So nothing was done in the Lisbon Treaty about this. Everything has been done in the Constitution. Uh, so uh, there is somewhere in the book you say that council and legal service did this and this. That's not true. I mean, they, they did not do anything. It's only uh, the, the, the convention that's been done by the convention. And I can tell you, Council and the legal, then the legal service, they did not see what, hap what was happening. They lost it. And they discovered the problem after the signature and ratification, as the member states, by the way. And I, have, I was the witness of this surprise of the member states. Uh, I will come to this later. Uh, so I think this has to be maybe a little bit uh, explained in a, in a more clear way in the book. Now, uh, <coughs> what I like very much is really this uh, angle of power distribution, and I think it is a very good way to see what happens now and what will happen in the future, in the near future. Uh, why? Because your basic question, why delegate, what to delegate, how to delegate, they are really the questions for the legislator and the commission now because the Lisbon Treaty has put your question in the center of the new system. In the past, of course, with one single system of conferral of power, comitology only, it was a little bit possible and simple to have some vague delegations of power to the commission, such as, I mean, the commission shall take all appropriate measure to implement the present chapter, full stop. And, and that's it. It is now impossible and contrary to the treaty to do so. Now, according to the treaty, because of the two articles, because you have two articles, you have to choose, you have to distribute, and you have to know exactly what you want to achieve. So this is very difficult huh, for the commission services because as I, I mean, I do remember many, many conversations with, the, with, with my colleagues within the DGs saying that, uh, my question was, okay, you want powers, fine. You want powers to 
do something in addition to the legislation. That's okay, but now you have to tell me why. Why do you want power? I mean, to do what exactly? And it's sometimes very difficult for the Commission services to well, because we think, I mean, we need some powers to anticipate uh, a future uh, evolution, and, but we don't know yet exactly why. But you have to know. That's the, I think it's a major change and a major improvement of the situation for, for a democratic scrutiny. It's very, very good. I mean, the treaty on this is very good. The new treaty is very good. It obliges the commission, the executive power, to explain to the legislator why it wants powers and to do what. So you have now two situations. Either the commission would like to be empowered to do what the legislator itself should, would be able to do, to complete the legislation, to supplement the legislation, even to amend the legislation on non-essential elements. That's the delegated act. Or the commission would like simply to be able to give effect to the rules defined by the legislator to implement them. That's Article 291, that's the comitology, the new comitology. So now the services of the commission are obliged to, to have this demarcation line in their mind. And they have to be very specific in their proposals to the legislator. So, it, of course, it was not the case in 2010, because 2010 we, we dealt with formal proposal, proposal made before the Treaty of Lisbon, so it was a, a mess. But now with, with all the new proposals, normally uh, uh, the situation should be clearer and the legislator should have in front of it clearer, I mean, and, uh, more, a better analysis of what the Commission wants to do. Uh, so, now, how EP Council Commission reacted to that new, uh, new uh, uh, institutional context. Uh, well, the Commission has really tried, but I'm not sure we have succeeded to, to do it, but we have tried to explain in advance how we interpret this change. So we have adopted, as you know, a communication in December, I mean, nine days after the entry into force of the Treaty of Lisbon, the night of December 2010, 2009, sorry, a communication to explain how we see to Article 290. And in parallel, we have also launched the, the reform of comitology in accordance with Article 291. For this 290 communication was followed by a report of the, of the Parliament. You, you quoted this report of 2010. Uh, uh, criticizing the Commission to be too uh, comitology friendly in its approach of, of delegated act. Um, I disagree with that and, and we have, I think, clarified this later on. We have signed also this, this common understanding in 2011 and we have also adopted uh, very uh, long and precise guidelines to our services on Article 290. And the first part of those guidelines are about the demarcation line, and they are public. Eh? So you, you, I have a copy, I have even a, a memory stick with me, I can, I can give everything to you, but it's already public since June, eh? since June 2001. And in those guidelines we have 10 pages, 10 pages on what are for us the criteria to distinguish 290 to 91, which is now a treaty problem. Eh? And, 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 if, uh, and, and how we see how to adapt uh, how to adopt uh, a delegated act. On the demarcation line, I don't want to, to, to bother you with, with all the detail, but this is very important to bear in mind that if the legislator got it wrong, the basic act is illegal. Okay? So if you confer on the Commission powers under 291 where it should have been 290, that's wrong, that's illegal, and the court will destroy that. Okay, and not only this, but if you confer powers under Article 291 to the Commission where normally it should be 290, then the Commission will adopt only illegal implementing acts. So any subsequent decision taken by the Commission on the, on the basis of that kind of wrong delegation 
would be illegal. So it's a kind of cascade of illegalities. That's very dangerous. Uh, so on this, and we are in a very dangerous situation now. Why? Because uh, a council has discovered how delegated act function at the very last minute. Um, so we came to the council with our draft communication in November, October, end of October 2009 to explain to the council what we will adopt as a communication. And we did the same with, with Parliament, but at this time it was not possible to, of course, to meet a rapporteur because it was a, a draft communications. So we had some contacts at the level of this services level with Parliament and with the Mertens. So you, you, you refer to that report of the, of the Mertens group in your book. And I can tell you what happened in the Mertens the first, the first day we, we came to the Mertens. We just explained this, okay, there is a delineation mark between 290 and 291, everybody agrees that it's very important to be clear. And now how the Commission, how the commission will adopt Delegated Act. But we adopt Delegated Act without comitology, of course. There is no more comitology. So the member states were astonished, of course. What are you saying? I mean, and then they turned to the legal service of the council and the legal service of the council said, yes, it, that's true. But they never before, the legal service of the council said that to the member state. So it was just a surprise. And of course, they said that, that, that how, I mean, how the commission will do it. And that's why, of course, we have introduced all this informal process of expert groups. So no comitology, but expert groups. And it's, it's, it is explained in detail in our guidelines. But what is important is that those expert groups are expert groups in the hands of the commission. There is no opinion delivered. There is no vote. It is no question to amend anything. It's not to discuss and to negotiate a future delegated act, it's to take the expertise of the member states. We don't want to choose the experts. We let the member states choose the experts. That's to answer one question in your, in your book. Yes, there will be experts representing the member states. So that's one thing. Expert groups, no comitology, no vote, no deadline, no language issue, no formal opinion. So quite informal. And it's not only about member states, because in all these expert groups, Parliament could participate. So that's the other new element of it. In any expert group, preparing a delegated act, the Commission will invite all the 27 permanent representation in Brussels with an agenda, with a working document, which is not a draft delegated act, which is a working document kind of future delegated act, and that invitation will be sent as well to the Parliament with the agenda and the documents. And then the Parliament, if the Parliament say, I, want like, I would like to go, I don't see any reason why the Commission will refuse it. So that's a new type of preparatory phase <coughs> with expert groups made of member states plus potential participation of the Parliament. Of course, the question was, but who from the parliament? Same question, who? Oh, politicians. Yes, it could be. We don't have any instructions to give to the parliament on this. But it's up to the parliament to choose. They can send, of course, people from the secretariat, people from the committees, assistants, why not? Members of parliament, why not? Or their own experts, if they have some. We don't. We don't have any strong views on this. So that's the beginning of a new process. It's not comitology. Of course, of course, the, the Commission will have to take seriously this preparatory phase. Because if the Commission is, does not prepare in a serious manner a delegated act, that delegated act subject to the veto of Parliament and Council could be, of course, uh, uh, destroyed later by Council or by Parliament. So it's the own interest of the Commission to involve well in advance Member States and Parliament. So that's, that's 
where we are and, and, and how the council takes it. I mean, it's exactly what you have said. I mean, in terms of power distribution, council is upset by this. Member states are upset by the, by the treaty they have signed but because they haven't read it. <laughs> so what are they doing now? Well, it's very simple. Each time they see the, 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 the word delegation, they put a gun on the table. And they say, we don't want delegation, we want comitology. Because comitology means member states. So now, today, in each, in every single legislative proposal, you have a fight, a battle between commission, parliament, council about delegated powers. So what the council is trying to do is to either to reduce the scope of the delegation or even to oppose the idea itself of delegation or, which is more perverse and more dangerous, to try to transform what we consider as a delegation of power into implementing powers. They try to say, no, 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 it's not Article 290, it's Article 291. This is very dangerous and this will end up in court very soon, I think. Uh, in two or three occasions, we were, we, we were facing that situation. Council was transforming artificially actual delegated powers into implementing powers, and Parliament accepted it um, for probably, I mean, reasons, I mean, because of the circumstances of the case. It's kind of political deal. I give you two delegated power, and I, you give me three implementing, and then we can have a deal on this and this and this provision. That's the package deal at the end of the day. And then 290, 291 are part of the package deal, which is dangerous because you create Ill illicit delegations or implementing powers by this package deal. So yes, council has rapidly anticipated its loss of power by trying to avoid delegations or transform delegation into implementation. And some of those transformations are potentially illegal. So this is a big issue. Um, so I think now we will certainly see how EP Council Commission could find a way to be more, uh, uh, well, less, uh, uh, how can I put it, could see a kind of a new common understanding on, on the delineation mark, but certainly we need some case law of the court on this. It won't be possible without case law, and, and it will come in a few years, probably, or a few months or a few years. Um, last word about com the, the new comitology. Yes, I mean, I do agree we haven't changed the rules completely. Uh, it is still member states' control. What is new, of course, is the council is out. There is no more supervision by the council. Well, it's, I can tell you, aesthetic, uh, I think you're wrong on this. Um, firstly, you have to, to know that when we make our proposal, uh, the legal service of the council was, of course, furious and, and made long statements saying that, no, 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 the new treaty perfectly authorizes the council to, be, to stay as the supervisor, supervision of it. Uh, uh, and, and, well, we said no, and, and Parliament supported us on this, and of course they were obliged to agree, uh, unless no comitology, no new comitology would be put in place and the Parliament would have blocked the whole legislative process rapidly. Uh, the disappearance of the Council is not aesthetic. Why? Why does it mean now? I mean, if you look at it, uh, in the past the Council was one could say, well, well, the council was not that important in the past. That's not true. The council was the threat. The council was the body to which the commission does not want to go, did not want to go. So the, uh, under the regulatory procedure, the commission was always trying to avoid a no opinion, so trying to 
make concessions to the member states within the committee in order to obtain a positive opinion, in order to avoid the council, because no opinion meant the council. So that's why we, were, we, we had, I mean, five, five, ten cases per year before the council. But the threat was real, I mean, actual. I mean, and, and, and the commission services were doing their best to please enough the member states in order to avoid any no opinion, to obtain qualified majority in favor, as if it was a legislative process. So it was not aesthetic in the past. So because it was not aesthetic in the past, the disappearance is not aesthetic in the future now. The threat has disappeared. It has been replaced by this appeal committee stuff. There is now, we have uh, appeal committee. But what is appeal committee? The council has tried hard during the negotiation to transform this appeal committee on a simile council. And they failed. They failed. It's a comitology committee. It is chaired by the commission. So now it is clear, from A to Z, the commission control the whole comitology process. There is in no way another institution which could interfere, intervene, and, 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 and replace the commission. The council cannot replace the commission. There is no threat of replacement, of substitution, of callback, as it was the case in the past. So from A to Z, commission in the driving seat. And that's a very important change, I must say. Of course, you have still this threat of no opinion and going to the appeal committee. But what the appeal committee is? Let's see the first example in, in July, August this year. Sanko. Sanko was facing a no opinion because UK was able to have a kind of blocking minority in, in, in a committee and then no possibility to have a positive opinion. So in August, in, in July, on the 20th of July, they, 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 said, oh, they had the vote, no opinion. In August, they decided to go to the appeal committee. They sent a letter to all PEM rep to organize the meeting in the beginning of September of the appeal committee, a meeting chaired by the commission with the commission text, with the commission power to accept or not amendments and to put what the commission wants to put on the table for the vote. And in a few hours, it has been done. We submitted to the vote exactly the same text because we were not able to accept any amendments proposed by the UK. And a second no opinion was delivered, but in that case, before the appeal committee, the commission has the, the free choice to adopt. So it took us eight weeks to solve that issue. Please tell me how long it will take in the ancient system. You have to prepare a formal proposal of the commission to the council. It takes one or two months. Then you submit that to the council. It's in the hands of the council. The council is the master of ceremony. The council negotiates within its working group. And the council has three months to do it. So five months as a minimum. So we have, I think, saved three, three months, probably. So yes, that's a major change. That's a major change. There are other changes, but this one is really important. The other major change is inclusion of trade policies within comitology. That's a revolution. Uh, trade policy was in the hand of the council before. Um, okay, I was too long, sorry. <laughs> but uh, that's what I had to say for the timing. I'm sure we will come back to various uh, of the questions which you raised, but I think first of all, maybe Kathleen should respond to a few issues. Yes, I mean, I've also seen those cases where uh, a deal was made on using implementing acts where it should have been a delegated act. But I think it's there where it would be useful if the commission officials could overcome their psychological friendship yeah, with exactly. the council because in many negotiations I would have simply wished yeah. the commission to clearly say the parliament is right mm -hmm. and that was not coming. Uh, which issues you're talking about exactly? Energy. Uh, the cross-border health care. Uh, uh, in my novel foods. Uh, <laughs> 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 
The, the worst one was the uh, energy, uh, I don't remember, the, in the field of energy, uh, a high official of the commission was instructed to support the, the parliament and he spent the whole trilogue to convince parliament to give up. And he succeeded. Hmm? In a trilogue, in a, a trilogue, I mean, in a negotiation council, parliament, commission, commission. The commission was supposed to support, was instructed to support the parliament, and it supported the council, as Katrina said. And I agree with that. And it's the, the old reflex of of of, uh, of commission official to consider that that's not that important. But I can tell you that uh, this uh, this this. Uh, Senior official has a very difficult time in, in, in the commission afterwards. Um, and unfortunately, what I regret myself is that we are not able to be strong in the, in the negotiation on these issues, and we, we didn't yet, we haven't yet submitted a case, a, a good case to the court. But it has to come, it has to come. I mean, on the on the more technical aspects of your chapter on, on on Parliament, I think what you said at the end, trade policy, there was also something in your text which I didn't <coughs> quite understand. You speak about common commercial policy and comitology, but it was in fact never in comitology. That was precisely the problem. So I, I saw also a problem there. And with the convention, I had the same thought uh, because in fact, uh, what I have done at some point was to go back to the text of the convention because they're quite useful to read to actually understand the intentions uh, behind the articles. And uh, you quote at some point this uh, final report of the working group on simplification and I think it's really there. There it's explained exactly uh, what the intentions were uh, and also to, to, to have the background that the whole idea of the system was simplification also, uh, and not making matters much more complicated as we, uh, <laughs> I think there are as we now. I think about that, all, even if you could take it back to the working group, I, uh, I think a lot of the people in there were quite uh, aware that you know, by selling it, simplification came well, they could achieve. Well, sorry, that was Whatever I want, but that's dangerous. I have, I have three pages with comments. But okay, I'll repeat that one for, for, for the record, which I, which I might come back to anyway on my third page or something. But I wanted to say it anyway. I agree that wanted to understand all of this and, and be conspiratorical or analytical, whatever, about the reasons behind it. It's useful to look at the travaux préparatoires, and, and, and that we find most significantly, significantly I think, in, in the work of the convention, in particular uh, Giuliano Amato's working group 11, was it on simplification. Yeah. Uh, and there in particular, in one, one of the, the, the specific uh, expert opinions which were presented to that group, the, the one from uh, Cohn Lennart in, uh, in the European Court of Justice, because that, yeah, sort of he, he introduces the logic and the vocabulary which so much is based on it. So I agree, but, but I also said, and I've written years, some years ago a lot about it, I mean simplification is a very catchy phrase. To, you know, which you shouldn't take for granted, that's everything about, you know, as with the entire reform, that everything is about making it transparent and easy for us to understand, because there is a lot in, in between, I think. So that's, that was the remark. Then, try quickly then to, since I got up, since I took the opportunity, to stole the opportunity to, to say a few things. Well, the first thing was, was back to, to what you said, uh, and, I, and I'm not trying to contest what you said, because I, I think you said it right, what you said it rightly, but I think it can be said clearly that, well, everyone who's been working in comitology one way or another is aware that most people think it's terribly boring. They th and they think in particular that they know what it is from the start. And what they think they know is also that it is something very boring. Because it's very technical and it's politically insignificant and therefore it's boring. Therefore boring. And, and that is also part of the logic pressed upon politicians in the convention, I think, within, within the convention in particular by the working group, that you know, don't bother too much about what we 
proposed now when it comes to this new regime, because you're basically supposed to be not interested in this because it's about the mere technical details. And, and, and there I am a bit cynical, and, and, and I think one should be, you know, because the point with that, as I see it, is that if we can make the European Parliament feel the way you don't necessarily feel, but say that most of this stuff we know from the, the start is boring, it's about the size of, of cages for chickens or whatever, then you know, we can use that boring part of rulemaking sometimes to do something important because we know that the European Parliament, or we hope that the European Parliament will not see it because they think they know it's boring and therefore we can achieve important things every now and then. And I think that there's solid to support, it, support to say that this happens every now and then and I think this is the main reason why the European Parliament have been fighting so hard to get the reform, the reform they now got. So that's, that even if most of it is technically boring, there is a lot more to, to say. And I think to underline that, it is highly interesting to see a very sharp trend throughout the history of the European Union, and particularly the last 10 years. Rulemaking is more and more, the quantity of rulemaking is more and more becoming rulemaking by the Commission and not by 27 member states in the European Parliament. And quantity doesn't say anything about qualities, but hmm, is it because the EU is doing more and more boring stuff, or is it because the politicians get a more and more narrow definition of what is important and not boring? Important questions rather than answers, I think. Uh, delegation, the notion of delegation which is one reason understandable why you think sort of the book uh, is uh, asymmetric perhaps to the, 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 the discussion of the vocabulary of the, the Lisbon Treaty. But I mean, the book looks, is older than the Lisbon Treaty and, and talking about delegation pre-Lisbon was handy and it becomes complicated to it after. The, the Lisbon Treaty has cheated us a bit on that one could say. Yeah. And the thing I want to say on that respect is at the same time, you know, to require something from the reader, I think that the vocabulary introduced, the neat vocabulary introduced by the Lisbon Treaty is a bit also about playing, you know, ultimately I'm out in the working group playing us a trick, you know, to say, you know, this is a neat order. So now we construct everything from this order. And the neat order is to say that in some fields the Commission is supposed to get its power from the, from the EU, leg, from the EU, the EU legislature. In other parts it gets its power from the member states, <coughs> implementation. So it's just a humble servant from two different clear-cut orders. Yeah. But at the end of the day, governments and civil servants working for these governments uh, are involved on both levels. It's just that in one system you call them the council and the other you call them the representatives of the member states. But I mean, physically, it's the same people we talk about many times. And that is an important point. So I mean, well, whatever, you know, one should use delegation or not, one shouldn't buy that neat distinction too quickly, I think. That's really part of the future, you know, understanding of what's going on, I think. Uh, taking too much time. Try not to live. Well, I had something on, on L'Anfalusi feel, yeah. which I will, should I say or should yeah. I not say? Well, what did I want to say about that? Well, there it was, I guess. Actually, it was an honest question to you before saying that question, I guess. Uh, I mean, once again, the book, to, to give credit to the authors, claimed to deal with stuff before the Lisbon Treaty. So everything which has happened after the Lisbon Treaty is, is not systematically dealt with. It's not supposed to be dealt with in the book, really. But, uh, but I wanted to ask you I, I, you, you, I, I give the question to you to answer if you want in a few minutes when I, when I finish. But did, did you say, because I said at the start that I think uh, post Lisbon, we see few, very few delegated acts. I counted them myself, I thought, uh, to, to 2010 and 2011, and they're less than 10 altogether. But you say hundreds, and do you say hundreds of instances of, of delegations? Yeah. Exactly, and that's exactly, so it confirms what I say. We see much delegation, but we see few delegated acts, also covering the Lampalossi or the Lavoisier field, or whatever you want to call it, which is interesting, right? And we're talking about directives and regulations. Decisions is, is a more tricky thing. Well, that was everything I had on, on Lanfalusi. Uh, well, I want to say also one thing. The book, I think that's, it's, I shouldn't say it's a shortcoming, but it's, but it's a limitation one should be aware of when I, when I read it towards the end, as, as much of the discussion, for example, the discussion here today, this for, we talk about co what used to be comatology, comatology in a wider sense. Uh, as a system of control. And that's what typically what lawyers do, you know. Comitology is interesting because of case law, it's interesting for their comitology decision, comitology 
regulation, regulation, but these all talk about the formal rules for controlling and what happens, you know, if there is a disagreement. But empirically, you know, throughout history, comatology, I would say, has been characterized by, by the lack of conflict, by the surprising extent to which, to which the people involved, commission and member state representatives, have been agreeing. Yeah? And to my mind, the, the one reason for that, you know, the, the, for how little conflict mechanisms have been triggered is that there have been a very early, you know, proactive uh, and sort of anthropological, to some extent, uh, understanding, agreement, ID, uh, uh, unity in, in, in IDs. You know, in the system, civil servants from France and Sweden and so on, together with people from the Commission, take time in working groups and in the preparatory stage to agree on what's what's the problem and what's important to do. And once it becomes an official proposal, the comitology committee says, "Fine," because you know all problems have been sorted at an early stage. And that function, not the control function, but the participation function, you know. I personally think it's the most interesting things to keep our eyes on for the future. What happens to that function of post-Lisbon? Because that is less obvious, right? And I think in particular under Article 290, because the control function can't anymore be comatology, it's Council, European Parliament, but the participation function can still be comatology the way I see it. You know, the, how do we involve national experts in the work of the Commission and to what extent will the Commission realize it has to listen to these national, national experts for in the end its proposals to be formally adopted by the Council and the EP. And, and there I think comatology in a functional sense. Personally, I think it will continue to live there, but we sort of have to reinvent it or, or, or so. Uh, did I, while I'm using up, can I have just a final thing and I promise to try to shut up for the rest of the day after that. Um, well, I, I'm not trying to be nasty, but I want to be a little bit nasty perhaps. Well, the supposedly new, that's sort of where we, where you, you know, when I, when I say comatology 291 is not so different than you say, well, when I said that, it's, well, isn't it aesthetic? And you say, no, it's a major change. Uh, well, is it a new control of comatology or not? And what we're talking about is that what was previously the function, if there was, which happened very few times, disagreement within the system, a transfer was made to the council. That's how it was described before. And now there is an, a transfer to an appeal committee instead. Well, okay, it's an appeal to a committee. It's an appeal to an appeal committee. Well, you, you're proving my point. I'll make it in a second. But the appeal committee, who does it consist of? Well, it, it consists of member states, member states represent, representatives appointed by the member states' government uh, on an appropriate level. So what that level is, who there will be in the end, we, we will need time to sort of empirically prove, yeah? But at least from the Swedish government's point of view and the, and the experience this far, because I have quite had quite a lot to do with them the, 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 the last year in particular. I mean, it's ba they have been sending basically the same people, they say. So that would be my point. Well, in the end, it's the same people representing the same interest. Aesthetic or not, not want to be rude. It's obvious that the Commission has an interest to imprint on us that this is a major change. Well, I'm not so sure if it is, but it re definitely remains to be seen. That would be my final point. Thanks. Uh, I mean, first about your findings that there are so few delegated acts. I think it's quite natural that at this stage there are few delegated acts, simply because there's a delay. You need to adopt first the legislation which provides for the delegation of power, and then it's exactly the Commission who needs time to prepare the delegated act. So I think it's a quite natural development that at this stage there are few, as such, delegated acts. Uh, the second comment um, when you spoke about uh, a comitology is boring or uh, I think sometimes it's useful also to take examples and maybe if your students say yeah. you cannot uh, interest them for comitology let's take examples I mean there are very famous uh, examples in Parliament one of the re rejections in Prague was the famous meat glue case when you could make a, a ham of, uh, from Parma, but it was not actually a piece of ham, but you could glue together different pieces uh, and sell it as one ham. And the parliament objected, but it was a tight vote. So take an example. Or 
one of the files I had done myself was the uh, very famous uh, transmission of PNR data to the US a long time ago when the commission had to take a decision that the level of data protection in the US is equivalent to EU and we objected. It was a droit de regard and we said no, um, the commission exceeds its implementing power. This is very practical uh, cases. And I think this is exactly what the parliament does. I mean, politicians are very practical people. Huh? I mean, they look at the decisions and they try to find out what is it, what could happen with a comitology measure. Uh, and this is a bit, uh, I mean, yes, it's boring. Uh, not everything is boring. And the, the mindset people very often have to look is to look what could it be that would be decided on the comitology? And I think to be, to be honest, uh, the EU legislation is a very detailed legislation. If you compare it with legislation in other countries, like I sometimes compare US <coughs> legislation with European legislation on fields that I'm working on where I know exactly uh, what the EU does. I've compared what we have done with the visa information system and the US visit. I mean, to be honest, what Congress decides on is much less than what the European legislator decides on. Or if you take like uh, Californian law on uh, environmental standards or reducing CO2, that basically says we need to reduce it and gives all the powers to independent agencies or boards. So, to be honest with the EU legislator, uh, it is quite a detailed legislation already. Um, yes, I, I find very interesting uh, the difference between the, the, your discussion about control. And you do know that what, what is the word, that word is not, that verb is not, it is not used in the legislation. We say, we say the commission shall be assisted by. And, and but the, the funny thing is we had a discussion during the reform with member states because the me when, when we came into the room of the of negotiation, member states suddenly said, I mean the council said, no, no, things are not going well. We have problem with the commission. The commission is, is awful with us. We want to control and we want to put control instead of assist. So there was a kind of, of backlash reaction from, from, especially from Germany and France. Uh, and Germany was terrible during the negotiation. They ha they, Germany was uh, asking to change also the chairmanship of committees, to have member states as uh, uh, in the chair, et cetera. So there was an attempt to change, but you're right. This is about partnership plus control. Good partnerships goes with control, I mean, yeah. at the end of the day. Uh, and that's exactly what I was trying to say about the appeal committee. Uh, uh, yes, it's a ma major change, but Nevertheless, we haven't changed the philosophy. That's true. And we have always said that we don't want to change the philosophy. A change of philosophy would have to follow what we have said in the uh, Livre Blanc in the past. Only, con only uh, advisory committee, no more control, only assist. It was also the view of the legal service of the parliament at the very beginning of the process. Why the commission is too shy to propose what it has suggested uh, before to, 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 to uh, uh, forget about all comitology and move to a, the commission alone with the assistance of advisory bodies. Uh, we didn't, we didn't, I mean, Bar President Barroso was really clear on this. He wants the member state on board and he wants the member state to be able to control us, actually control. Um, on the boring technical, uh, I mean, Catherine is absolutely right. I mean, let one of the most recent examples is security scanners. Security? Security, security scanners, the body scanners. Oh, scanners. Okay. Okay. Um, they are authorized now, uh, subject to some requirements which have been defined uh, under comitology. For example, every passenger has the right to opt out. Well, except in UK, but UK is maybe, um, will certainly. Uh, be before the court uh, very soon on this, but they have introduced no opt-out, so uh, we have a problem with them. But this is one issue. GMO, of course, the classical one, we authorize GMO through comitology. Um, 
etc. And last point, uh, Lamphalusino, I was referring to, it was page 1A2, but it's not no longer <laughs> the right page, but you said, uh, the area of financial market regulation is not subject to Articles 290 and 291. It is still governed by the old comitology or Lamphalusi system. That's not correct. Uh, there is a declaration, a specific one, you're right, but this declaration is even annexed to the treaty. That declaration was made by the Commission to say, it's a declaration attached to Article 290, which is interesting to say. In the field of uh, financial markets, financial services, the Commission will maintain the consultation of the member states, blah, 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 blah. Just to say that we promise already at the time of the signature of the Lisbon Treaty to maintain a kind of lamphalusi within the delegated act system. But without the level, what level is it? The comitology is level two? I don't remember because those people, with, so three is the expert group, two is comitology, one is legislation. So I think comitology is level two. So it will be delegated act without level two. Uh, but that, that, that's, that's all we have to say about Lamphalusi. It's true that because of uh, uh, the specificity of, of what Lamphalusi is roughly, is roughly is, the pen is not in the hands of the commission. Huh? We have to be very clear on this. It's uh, the national authorities, okay? And the commission is here, but not here really. I mean, Lamphalusi is really something, a kind of intergovernmental thing to, to be, uh, or at least inter-national authorities, okay? And it has been confirmed by all regulation adopted and directive adopted after Lisbon, because for delegated act, the European supervisory bodies will draft instead of the commission. I, mean, I believe it's, not, it's against the treaty, but it has been decided. And on this, Parliament and Council agree not to give too much to the commission, but to give really very much to the supervision authority, which is also anthropologically interesting to see. Sometimes that Parliament trusts more member states than the commission, because who are the members of Parliament? I mean, national politicians. <laughs> It's, it's also a reality we don't have to forget. So. Uh, no, so a last remark. To really well illustrate what you said, uh, I can give you another example on how rapidly uh, uh, institutions adapt in order to uh, maximize their powers. It's about Prague and, 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 and Delegated Act. So Prague, the, the new comitology introduced in 2006. We do know that Council was not a friend of Prague. Council was dis, disliked Prague. And during the alignment in 2007, 2008, 2009, it was really boring for them. They were like, you know, not really happy to do that. Uh, because it, it was to, just to give something to the parliament. So, uh, and suddenly after the Lisbon Treaty, they fell in love with Prague the day after. Because as soon as parliament said, oh, could we now? Uh, so, uh, because the day after, uh, council said, oh, but look, Prague is wonderful. It's comitology plus veto. That's, that's so nice. So each time Parliament came and said, well, when the Commission will align and, and, and get rid of this pack and transform the pack into delegated act, <laughs> no hurry. And by the way, pack and delegated act are very different one. When you look at the definition, exactly the same. But no, 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 no. The context has changed. So now you have a council, I mean, they are pack fan. Uh, and, and the parliament is a little bit the contrary, but not exactly. But now parliament was always a Prague, Prague, Prague. And now the day after the entry force of the Lisbon Treaty, they turned to the commission, wow, when are you going to get rid of this Prague? And they, we have spent three years forced by the parliament to align all the community aki to Prague. And the day after say, do it again. <laughs> so that's exactly the type of uh, attitude you which, can, which could illustrate what you have said in your, in your book.
So it is a question about the practice, the current legislative practice. So if I understand well, so there are many legislative acts in which dele um, uh, delegation clauses are inserted and implementation clauses at the same time. You have both in most cases. Are there also examples where you only have delegation clauses and no implementing powers for the institutions? Should I say something quick? I mean, I, I, what I did before Christmas when we were wrapping up the book was that I had, since the book is about everything before Lisbon, we still think, thought it was, would be nice to have an idea of, sort of an empirical idea of what's, what's after. But so, I, so I did a quick look through at all the acts. I mean, it wasn't quick, it took a week or a few days, but it was still, relatively speaking, quick. Yeah. And, and as far as I, I mean, and I have everything important recorded as far as I remember, but, but I didn't bring it, but, but I do think that I did come across some, not few, not many, uh, cases where there would be... Actually, I started assuming, you know, I'm look, I was looking for either delegation, 290 clauses, or 291 clauses, yeah. And I was, I started to notice what you said, that I found some, you know, the first one I noticed where I had both. And then I started to record this as quite normal, that there were both, you know, that one legislative act contained both options, we could say. Uh, but I, th I think I, s I didn't lose the impression that there were cases where there were either or as well in both cases. I can check it if you want. Well, either or in the sense of only implementing powers? Yeah. Be there will be some basic acts which only had a delegation clause and no implementation, no comitology clause, and, and, uh, and some which would have only implementation, not delegation. I would actually sort of intuitively guess that the last category was, was less frequent. I, I would more, more common, I think, but that's, uh, you know, I guess, only but only delegation than only implementation, actually, but I, well, I wouldn't swear on that, actually. Why do you find it, why do you, why do you find it interesting? Why do you ask? Um, yeah. <laughs> no, I would, no, I would expect, I would expect to have legislative acts with only implementing powers because that used to be the pattern before. That's why I would expect this to continue even, even today. Whereas the other one, to have only have delegation powers being given to the commission and no implementing powers, that would be really a novelty, a new way of, of conceiving of the role of the EU and the member states in a sense, no? So uh, that would seem a bit more surprising to me. But then I was on that, from my perspective, and I would reason sort of the contrary. I mean, to what is delegate, what, you know, if to find only a delegation clause now, post Lisbon, wouldn't be surprising to me because there were delegation clauses before. I mean, some of the implement, what was called implementation in the wider sense before, yes. the most sensitive cases roughly were, <coughs> were exactly about what is now called delegation. So, from that point of view, it wouldn't be surprising, I think. Uh, maybe, maybe there are three pos possible answers to that. I mean, the first is, you may, you may easily find some uh, legislation with only delegation where uh, the legislator has decided to, to legislate with some annexes and then it, the power given to the commission just to amend the annex. It's a typical and classical delegated act. I mean, there is no other way to amend an annex. You must have 290. Uh, it's, a, it's a must, uh, there's no other way. So. For example, this regulation will be changed, I think, uh, the, the, the Brussels one, the, uh, the regulation on, on jurisdiction and, and recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments. Uh, there is a proposal from the Commission to modify it with some annexes, and I think there is no implementing powers in that regulation. It's a regulation on international private law plus some forms. And, and, and in annex and to modify the form you need to. Yeah, that's you uniform know. law. Yeah, that's it uniform law. That, that, no, implemented. exactly, yeah. you're right. Uh, now in the future, I don't really know. I mean, one, in abstract, there is two answers to that. In abstract, or legally, and this is of course personal views, I believe that Article 290 scope is very wide and Article 291 is not that wide. To supplement to amend is very often. Very often, very often the Commission is empowered to 
flesh out. You, you use very often that expression, to flesh out the legislation. That's exactly what tonight you would like to cover. Uh, so in theory, in abstracto, tonight you could really uh, spill over and, 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 and cover many, many, many things. And implementation will be really uh, for uh, uh, specific decision in concrete cases, marketing authorization, uh, financial decision, etc. Uh, equivalence. Yeah. Some of them very interesting, important, but to apply criteria to a concrete situation, the blacklist of, of uh, air companies, uh, the blacklisting of, of uh, air companies is a concrete decision in a specific case. Uh, so in theory, 290 will be important, 290 will less important. In, politically, it's not the case today for the reason I explained before, um, because council is very reluctant. So one evolution, which could be a good one, is that the legislator will legislate more. More details in legislation. So because the only way sometimes, even for the, the, the legal service of the council, they cannot transform delegation into implementation. It's, it's not intellectually possible always. So they could say, no, no, we don't want to delegate to the Commission. We want to do it ourselves by co-decision, even for annexes. We have, I think we have seen in the, in the, some annexes now in the hands of the legislator. Huh? Uh, I do remember that Germany uh, was very strong in co-repair on this, and uh, finally the Council opposed to give delegation to the Commission to modify some annexes, because annexes are important. So legally, in abstract to in theory, 290 should be very wide, but in practice, we don't know yet. Uh, one day the court will intervene, will step in with a, with, a, with a judgment, will say this is 290, it can't be 291, or vice versa. You don't know, it's up to the court. And then, of course, the legislator will have to adapt itself to, to that case law. Uh, so we need probably five, uh, from five to 10 years to know, to answer your question. Thank you. Uh, one question pre-Lisbon and one uh, post-Lisbon. Uh, on the pre-Lisbon, uh, I was interested, uh, I would like to hear more about specific issue area that you mentioned where, you know, the trends towards delegation was, you know, came first or, you know, is more prominent in other areas where, you know, they lag behind and whether you have an explanation for the different uh, speed of delegation in different uh, areas. Because in a way, I, I will agree that agricultural issues were an early candidate for these kind of uh, quick, easy decisions, uh, while other areas uh, have uh, probably not followed the same pattern. Um, post Lisbon, uh, I was very interested by this idea that the Commission has to explain the rationale for uh, asking it to 190 rather than to 191 uh, procedure. I was wondering whether you can see any sort of uh, um, building blocks or future positions that uh, will help, uh, th that will develop in the future in terms of philosophical understanding um, how to uh, choose one line rather than the uh, other one. And to what extent do you think that uh, um, preemptive considerations in political terms of acceptability among member states uh, are still prominent in what the Commission tries to do or not do, or whether you know, they're trying to stir away from any political debates about the use of these uh, articles. And similarly, uh, in anthropological terms, uh, when you talk about the new expert groups and the kind of uh, dynamics that, uh, that develops into the expert uh, groups, um, to what extent do you think that they are vital to the Commission in terms of the knowledge that these experts actually bring to the Commission, or whether they are purely a sort of a yes or no game or legitimation game, rather than in terms of uh, enriching what the Commission is uh, uh, doing. Uh, 
Um, I think that there's some of the differences that you see in different policy areas that sort of follow from the overall structure of the European Union in terms of that there are certain areas that are areas of EU competence, some are shared competence. Um, and those explain some of the, the, the variety that we see in, in, for instance, in the use of, of regulations and, and use of directives in certain areas. Um, of course, they don't explain, explain the trends then that we see in differences, but um, apart from that, there is uh, the possibility also that there are sort of intrinsic features of different policy areas and types of legislation. The, the level of complexity in legislation, the types of uh, benefit distributions inherent in, in uh, certain types of policies. And the, those kind of motivations may influence the extent of delegation and possibly also the choice of legal instrument, but mainly in delegation and in what we've been discussing um, in the book. But it's very difficult at this very abstract, very aggregate level of looking at sort of bulk legislation that is, in a sense, uh, wide categories that, that include uh, different types of legislation within the same category, it's very difficult to make those kind of inferences. So in a sense, in the chapter on this, we only discuss uh, the different motives that might be behind the differences that we observe. Um, and then, of course, when discussing um, different trends, for instance, increased in use in regulation in some areas, and also increased uh, in use of delegation. The trends are different, but there's a rise in delegation in all areas. Um, but it's possible also that we see part of that there's certain laws, for instance, the articles on the approximation of laws in the Euro European Union, um, that that article has increasingly been used um, with the choice of a legal instrument of regulation instead of directives as opposed to, and that can explain certain trends. For instance, the area of taxation, we also discussed this, that increased use in, of regulation in this area may reflect um, increased desire to speak directly um, to the recipients of the laws or the legal, legal subjects, which you can do through regulations, but you can't do through directives. So. There are different possible um, explanations for the differences that we see across uh, substantive uh, policy fields. And uh, since it's such a broad picture, I, I think one also has to be very careful in <laughs> giving very set interpretations to what it is that we see. And then finally, of course, in the treaties, um, the choice of legal instrument, if that's what we're talking about, regulations and directives, is of course for some policy areas specified it's specified in the treaties what you know choice of uh, directive over regulation interestingly one of the uh, legal exp experts at the commission um, mm. that I interviewed on this said that in the past the the commission had not interpreted these uh, um, guidelines or had interpreted them more as guidelines in the treaty articles but up post Lisbon this is now completely fixed so if a directive is mentioned that is the legal uh, instrument that will be used, regulation mentioned, that is the legal instrument that we use. This has not been so uh, in the past, and and uh, one got the sense that there has been also uh, quite a flexibility, and still is quite a flexibility in choice, although, of course, there is a sort of path dependency in the areas of choice of instruments. This is, thank you. regarding the development uh, under the six-pack regulations where there was a deadlock between the Parliament and the Commission on the one side and the Council on the other side in choosing whether, deciding whether it should be Article 290 or 291. And since there was a deadlock, it was then gave rise to this new form of a compromise, which is neither 290 nor 291 which is, has been used in the excessive imbalance uh, regulation. My question was, is that something which may be a model for further situations where there can't be clear decision for one or the other? Or didn't you come across any other instances except one, that one? Yeah, it is even 
even in the text of the regulation, right? Yeah. So, sorry, which regulations? It's the six pack regulation. Oh, the six pack. Yes. <laughs> but I just was wondering because it was a way in a, an emerging new institutional rule which emerged from the conflict of not being able to use neither either 290 nor 291. And I was just curious whether that may be a way forward for other cases. It's not the reverse qualified majority. No, no. It's also problematic, of course. I mean, the, 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 the little I know is, I mean, I can confirm that the, that sort of the old, what previously was called cosmetology and so on has a, a role within the, what you call the sex pack. I mean, exactly how it's been designed, I don't know. I, I, have, I, you know, I haven't gone into these regulations to look at it. Some specific rules of majority have been, have been created, but outside to 90 to 91 debate. So outside, this is, this is a kind of new, strange institutional animal, but... It's not the kind of third way if you can't choose between 290 and 291, I don't think so. Yes, it is. Actually, it was in the context of the scoreboard, right? Yeah. Where you observe how to rate the economic performance of excessive imbalances of member states. <coughs> the question of wh wh what is the scoreboard now? Is it uh, cosmetology? Is it 291 or is it 290? And there was this conflict yeah. and it was a deadlock. And so they came up with this compromise. The compromise is legislation with a specific uh, rule of majority. So, so, and the answer is a, a reverse majority. I think. I think. The uh, no, the answer is that the Commission consults both the Commission, uh, the uh, member states, and the Council and the Parliament, and then writes a letter to both. That's the, the content of the compromise. Yes, there are. But also obviously, there are another, no other instances up to now. Otherwise, there, there, there is this one. I mean, the, this cre the creativity of the legislator it could also be seen in the supervision, the financial supervision package, because where the relation between the European supervision, supervision authority, the Commission within the preparation, for the preparation of delegate guidance is something very, very strange as well, very institutionally uh, awkward. So yes, there are probably some attempts. I don't think it's about the delineation, it's about how to ensure that the control mechanism are uh, really, do really fit with the specificity of one policy, one specific policy area. Because exactly, also the, the, the ideas of the member states when we were discussing trade. I mean, they say, but this is very specific. We, we need to find specific answer. So 290, 291 could be seen as too rigid. Sometimes facing uh, that rigidity, the legislator will try to create new animals. Uh, we don't, I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think it, it could be seen as uh, uh, examples of third ways in general. I don't think in it's this, a, In this example, it's a soft law measure in the end mm -hmm. that the commission mm -hmm. thinks. Well, so that's the, that's a special, the no, no, I know, but what the commission is then doing is send a letter, that's what you mm -hmm. say, yeah. send a letter to the members. So it's not a formal act. And in that sense, it's not subject to, to the 290-291 system. So it's, it's a soft law measure, yeah. and therefore they can invent new procedures. Yeah. That happens also in other areas. Well, there was also, <laughs> example, there, there was also an example in, in the Galileo, in the Galileo uh, area. I do remember also the creation of a strange body, of a, a, a super body created with parliament, council, commission to follow uh, uh, space policy and so on. So, Yes, each time you have a kind of conflict, then you know we create new new monsters. Maybe I, I should <laughs> I should respond to your question because I, I did not. Yeah. Uh, on on the demarcation line, uh, the, the delineation between 290 to 91, there is no building block. There is no uh, policy areas where systematically it will be one or the other. What we have tried to do is to give some objective criteria 
to help all services to prepare and to negotiate mm -hmm. and and to avoid to avoid as much as possible uh, the politicization of it and the trade-off I mean give me two to 90 I give you one to 91 and we have a deal because that's that's the way it is done in Trilog and all people it's in their DNA they want to compromise you know <laughs> the DNA of negotiators in in Europe is I want a solution that not the you know in China or in the US they are not the same type of negotiators huh? if it's no it's no if no is not an answer for EU so they want to have something so sometimes they they are ready to forget about the treaty, legal requirements, and, and everything. <laughs> that's, that's the way it is. So we, we are really trying to, to uh, do it. Of course, there are many things which are very simple in the treaty. It's, it's obvious when it's to amend, amend an annex, or to amend an article, it's always a delegate vacuum. It's a formal power transfer on the Commission to change the text. It's very easy to see. It's very easy where it's on individual decisions, individual decisions always implementing powers. The problem is between the two magic, magic verbs, supplement versus implement. That's the problem. Mm. Here, we have tried in our guideline, I will let you the, the, the copy of the guidelines. I can, I, I can, I can, all legal service, the legal service of the commission has tried to say, a good tool to help distinguish blah, blah, is to ask whether the power conferred on the Commission is to determine what the member states must do or to determine how they are to act. So what they have to do is you have the power to add new obligation. It's a delegation of power because normally only the legislator could impose new obligation to the member states. But when you are only organizing how the member states will have to behave, it's more about implementation, procedural requirements. For example, uh, the classical example is the reporting obligation. Member states shall report every three years. Okay. If you impose to the member state what kind of information they have to give to the commission, it's a delegated act. You impose new, you, you fixed frame. If you just say what models and how frequently and, and uh, what kind of standard form they will use to have kind of uniform type of information, uh, uniform presentation, it's implementation. That's why I'm saying implementation is very, is very small and, and delegation is very large. That's, that's the way it is. Uh, and on, on expert groups, yes, I mean, they have, they have, I mean, an expert group has two functions. Yes, expert group will help the Commission to understand the problem and to know the reality on the ground. I mean, we have 27 member states now. Of course, the Commission services do not know the, the reality of those member states. We need them. That, that's obvious. They know, they have the expertise. We don't. So they, they are, that's, that's the difficulty of delegated act. They have to be the experts, but they have also to have instructions from their capital to a certain extent because they, we need to know not only what they know but how they think their member state will react in the council later at the veto stage. So it's a difficult task. Uh, we, we need a kind of uh, a, a political pre-endorsement of what we are preparing together. Uh, and exactly what exactly the same that we are waiting from the Parliament presents in the expert with it's more about political endorsement, political feeling. Do we feel that that delegated act we are preparing is sensitive for the Parliament? If, if it's about security scanners, yeah, it is. It is. If it's about changing the annex of uh, motor vehicle and to see the distance between the, the uh, I don't know which part of, of the car, no, it's not that important maybe for the Parliament, for the legislator. Uh, but expertise plus political endorsement. At the end of the day, uh, coming back to change or no change, uh, I tend to agree with, maybe with Scott Fredericks, at the end of the day, the whole system will not be that different. In the, 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 the institution will have different roles, but at the end of the day, it's all about partnership plus control. 
So it's like, you know, in the, in the, the, the Lampedusa novel, the Ghetto Pardo, huh? <laughs> Everything must change and nothing will change, huh? I don't know it in Italian, but... Uh, tout change, que tout change pour que rien ne change. It depends on the level of uh, abstraction, I think, in the, in the beholder, right? How closely we look at it, yeah. If we, if we stand closely, it changes a lot. If we step back a bit, maybe it doesn't change so much, I would say. Yeah. Maybe Catherine, you could um, talk a little bit about your experience in one of, you know, in the preparation of this automatic call instance, which is exactly including the parliament early, and obviously member states and the council early in preparing a draft, included in a pre-draft phase, even by the Commission. I mean, maybe very quickly, uh, I mentioned that uh, I was for the very first time in an experts meeting. Huh? <laughs> We've been speaking about this for so long. Uh, it, was, it was an interesting uh, experience, but it was really like the Commission services underlining it's not a comitology committee, this is a an experts meeting to prepare to help the Commission drafting uh, uh, a delegated act. And it was about uh, e-call, like when you have an accident that your car calls automatically the oh. ambulance and so on. And I mean, for me, it was an interesting experience and I think member states still have to get used to the uh, fact, yeah, okay, there is no draft agenda which provides for a vote, there is no draft measures send in all languages. There was no text. Huh? This was before the Commission started drafting. Uh, uh, so one, one could feel that, uh, yeah, there is a psychological yeah, step to make somehow. Uh, and I think I also felt a little bit that the Commission people were quite happy that we were there. Uh, because, uh, yes, this underlines that uh, it's a new it's a new animal that is uh, born there. Um, but actually, um, I would have a, another issue or question also for, for Antoine, because um, for delegated acts, we <coughs> always speak about two conditions of the delegation, which is the possibility to revoke, uh, call it back from the commission, and that we can oppose. But the, the treaty wording does not say that these are the only two conditions of delegation. And also when you go back to the, uh, to the text of the conventions that we discussed, I think it was quite a deliberate choice that these two conditions are not the only two, but that there was a deliberate choice made in the wording of the article to allow that potentially there are other conditions. Such as? Such as? I stumbled by accident already uh, about uh, conditions. So there are two texts on statistics and transport, one on tourism statistics and on one on road transport statistics, where in my view there is a new condition inserted, which is that when the Commission adopts delegated acts, it shall ensure that this does not create an excessive uh, additional burden on the institutions collecting these uh, statistics. Uh, and there's also, an, and that's in an article, it's in an article of those two regulations. And then there's another case, I think it's a recital that the Commission should consult social partners before uh, deciding. Uh, so in my views, at least those two, the, I read them very much like additional conditions for the delegation of power to the Commission. Uh, and I've always had the feeling that the Commission thought of, tried to interpret 290, that the revocation and opposition are the only two conditions that one could have. So I would be very curious to hear a bit. Uh, Can I add very quickly to that question? Clarifying, because that interested me, you know, seven years ago when, <laughs> when I was speculating about the future. But I mean, what, what, what she talks about specifically for information, I mean, it was it, the change of one word between the, what was proposed by, by, the work, by, by the convention and what was the result, the draft, uh, accepted by, you know, what became the constitutional treaty. It was, I think, it, it, the change happened in the... I, uh, either it was at the end of the convention or in the IGC, it doesn't matter, but the first version was that it should say delegation under what became Article 290, these 
are the two, the only two. It shall be either of these two mechanisms. Initially, there were even three. Yeah? And that word shall was changed to a may, to may be. It may be either of these. So it's, a, so it's a very legalistic observation you're making. Yeah? Does the difference sh changing from shall, which is read as interpreted as exclusive, into may as an, you know, a more exemplifier? And that you add to this sort of uh, empirical support, observations that new creatures have occurred is, is an extremely interesting question, I think. Uh, maybe firstly, uh, finish with the expert group and participation of the parliament, maybe to, be, to clarify that. Participation of parliament is not something the commission has decided only vis-a-vis -vis the legislative act, but it's a general uh, common understanding. It's a, the framework agreement between commission and parliament, which has introduced that new possibility for parliament representative or parliament experts, that's the right term, parliament's experts to participate in, in expert groups where all member states are represented. So, so as soon as you have 27 experts from the member state in a room, parliament should have the possibility to ask to be invited. It's not a formal, it's an in indirect invitation. Uh, uh, and this is difficult, and I, I agree with Catherine, it will take time for the member states to, to, uh, to accept that. And I think in one example uh, in, in the field of, uh, of the agencies, uh, the Helsinki agency working groups, expert groups, uh, about Kimi, uh, chemical product, uh, member state went on, on strike because parliament was present. <laughs> there is someone from the parliament. We remain silent, and, they, and they, I think I think France decided to organize a, a, an expert meeting in Paris without the commission, with all, only the member states, uh, like a retaliation against this this, this uh, outrageous pres presence of, of uh, parliament. But it, it is difficult also for the commission sometimes to know uh, how to work because it's important to have the member state in the room. And then if you have the parliament, member state will leave the room. So. <laughs> Okay, uh, this being said, uh, it's, it's a difficult issue. I mean, I have read as well the, the, the treaty, the constitutions. I mean, uh, we took a formal view on this, and, and we think there are, there are only two conditions. And we, this is the legal service of the Commission views, and the Council legal service as well. Uh, uh, it would have been better to see this condition may only be the two following ones. But uh, uh, we, the treaty is, is written as it is written, and, and we can't change it. But it is obvious that when we talk about conditions, we talk about control. Okay? The only way to control the commission is revocation objection. There is no other way. Uh, this is always, I, I, I do accept, I mean, personally, that this is not something that obvious when you read the text. No, it's not. Now let's move to a more political approach, and if it was not limited, it would authorize uh, first the reintroduction of comitology. That would be, of course, the first reflex of, of the member states. So I'm very happy that the legal, the legal service of the council has decided this is the two only condition. Because another condition to control the commission would be to say, draft delegated acts should be submitted to committees of member states and also to uh, parliamentary committees. And then we, we, we will be able to go for a mini court decision. So no interest of delegation. We don't have any interest in delegated act if it's as difficult as court decision or as difficult as PAC, meaning comitology plus veto. Uh, so this is not only a legal interpretation, it's also a political one. Uh, now, what you, the example you gave about um, a limitation of the delegated act should respect this, this, and this, or consultation of social partners. There are two good examples, but there are examples not about conditions, but about precondition modalities. It's always this debate what are the condition of control, what are the modalities of preparation of? Um, well, on the first one, on 
the first example you give, Catherine, is about uh, uh, the scope and uh, the content and the objective. Objective content scope. It's possible for the legislator to say, by uh, where the commission will prepare delegated act, the, com the commission shall take into account this, 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 and this. It's substantial obligation. You have to take into account this, this, and this. And you cannot go beyond this or beyond that. That's, I think, paragraph one. Objective content scope. Social partners, it's in the recital, and we have tried to fight against this, but it's a, it has been imposed by the parliament. Yes, <laughs> by Econ Committee. Uh, and we wrote a letter to uh, the chair of Econ Committee, and she was upset with us. And she said, because we have agreed in the common understanding, the famous common understanding, we have agreed between the three institutions about everything but uh, delineation between 290 and 291. So normally the modalities of preparation of delegated act are fixed now. And we have models, and we have only one recital as a standard. We have a standard recital which said that the commission, uh, uh, it is of particular importance that the commission carry out appropriate consultation during its preparatory work, including at expert level. This is a recital which has been discussed for six months between the commission, council, parliament in order to avoid comitology coming back to the, to the window, to the back door, uh, uh, and in order to be sure that we cannot impose to the Commission mandatory consultation. And this agreement, this common understanding, uh, is taken very seriously by the Commission. I'm afraid it's not always the case by the Council or, or by some rapporteur in the Parliament. So this is a common understanding, this is not binding, which is true. So I will add social partner. That's the Econ Committee has decided. So instead of uh, appropriate consultation, say social partner, and then get had also, and, and, and the Pope and the Holy Church and uh, everyone, everyone. I mean, it's possible to add. According to some people in, in, in the Parliament, it's possible to modify that recital and not to stick to it, uh, which is legally true, but politically a little bit strange because the common understanding has been also initiated by the Parliament. Uh, it was an idea of the parliament to have a kind of common approach of, of how to, to proceed. So this being said, it will be s probably one difficult issue in the future, how to ensure that we don't invent, reinvent the wheel each time and create new modalities. Uh, within the commission, I think we believe that it's, it's enough to have a standard recital and it goes without saying that, of course, the Commission will consult widely. I don't see any evidence of uh, uh, the commission, that the Commission will not do it, especially now. I mean, it's so, yeah, also here again, in the DNA now, whole Commission services to consult more widely than never, than ever. So, so I have doubt about the, 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 the opportunity to add a new modalities and new conditions. Uh, but again, legally, you can read Article 136 uh, uh, as a text which does not prohibit new condition, which does not prohibit comitology. Uh, but on this, if you read 290 and 291 together, it's difficult to say that uh, you may mix the two. Huh? They are too logic. Yeah? The Commission acts as a legislator in 290. It is controlled by the legislator. That's logical. And by the legislator only. Why we should ask, ask the member state to control the Commission in 290? And in 291, that's the country. The Commission is in as if it were, were replacing the member state, so the member state will control the Commission. And not the legislator. It's not the, the job of Parliament and Council to control implementing our job of the member states. So. This reading of the two article is at, at least more logical, but on the details, yes, they are very, it's bad drafting. Yeah? <laughs> and, and 291 is awful. I mean, this where uniform conditions for implementing it are needed, this is, this is really bad drafting, again, because it's really confusing. And now people will think that 291 and 290 are overlapping, and you can just play with them, which is absolutely untrue. Well. 
think we have come to a conclusion and I think we uh, would like to thank our practitioners really for this highly interesting input you've given us which is extremely valuable for us but also obviously as European citizens who are using and are under the impact of the large, large, large part of decisions which affect our daily lives uh, on a daily basis. So thank you very much, uh, Katrin. Thank you very much, Antoine, and thanks for your participation.